Hello and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast titled Solutions for In Vivo Barriers to Gene Therapy Vectors. My name is Sarah Hiddleston and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by GenScript. We'll begin the webcast with two presentations. The first is from Dr. Casey McGuire, Associate Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School, USA. And our second presentation is from Dr. Kimberly Arnold, Senior Marketing Specialist, Molecular Biology Reagent Services at GenScript. We'll then move on to a question and answer session with the speakers. You can ask a question at any point you wish throughout the webcast. To do so, please type your question in where it says type your questions here, and then press submit, and we will answer them today. And now, over to Casey. Hello, uh, my name is Casey McGuire, and I'm going to be talking with you today about solutions for in vivo barriers to gene therapy vectors. First, I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope you learned something and that we can have a uh, nice discussion at the end. Second, I really need to thank GenScript, the sponsor of this talk, for allowing me to speak with you today, and also Nature Research Custom Media for putting this webinar together. The purpose of this talk is really to educate people around some of the uh, issues with gene delivery with AV vectors. And I'm going to cover a lot of work that we've done in our lab, but also a ton of pioneering work done by a lot of other groups. By no means will this be able to be comprehensive and cover everybody who's contributed to the field in, in important ways. Um, there's no way I'll be able to give all of these pioneers the, the credit they deserve, um, but I'll do my best. Before we begin, I need to list my disclosures, which are shown on the slide. In the interest of time, I won't go through each of them, but the slides will be available for anybody who wants to look through. For those of you who are new to gene therapy, I want to give a little intro slide to kind of some of the basic concepts of gene therapy. So the goal of gene therapy is to correct a disease by addition of a normal copy of a gene to compensate for a non-functional or absence of gene product. This is typically used for recessive mutations. It's the most commonly used gene type of gene therapy. And it's also the one that's advanced the most into the clinic as far as AED vectors go. Second is editing or deleting a mutated gene in the con in the case of a dominant mutation, or can it even be a recessive mutation? This is using the very popular gene editing technologies such as CRISPR. You can also alt alter um, expression levels of gene products such as mRNA um, using sRNA or microRNA technology. Finally, you can add exogenous genes. This can be used for an example, cancer gene therapy with a bacterial toxin, which can kill tumor cells. I also want to give a historical timeline of gene therapy, really to show just how far the field has come and really how long it's been around. I think a lot of folks think of gene therapy being around maybe since the 1990s or the 80s, but really it started as early as 1960. This slide really can't encompass all the exciting findings in gene therapy, so it's not meant to be comprehensive. However, um, I tried to cover some important areas, and it is biased to AAV uh, gene therapy, as this is the topic of, of this presentation. So in the early 1960s, scientists doing basic virological research were beginning to understand how viruses could genetically modify host cells. Also, AEV was actually discovered as a contaminant in adenovirus preps um, during this time, just by accident. In the early 1970s, Friedman and Roblin conceptualized gene therapy as a way to treat human disease. In the early 80s, the first retroviral vectors were engineered. AEV genome was cloned into a plasmid by Jude Samalski and Nick Mazuska's lab in 1982, kicking off that vector. The first ex vivo gene therapy trial in humans was done in 1990 with a retrovirus vector. The first AEV in vivo gene therapy trial for cystic fibrosis was done in 1995. The field wasn't without its share of challenging times. In the 1990s, late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a couple of serious adverse events. The first was with adenovirus which led to the death of a patient in a clinical trial for OTC deficiency, 
really to an inflammatory response to the virus. In 2000, the successful treatment of X-linked skid using a retrovirus was reported. Unfortunately, a couple years later, four children in this trial developed leukemia, which was later determined to be due to insertional oncogenesis caused by the retrovirus factor. Luckily, uh, most of those patients were successfully treated for their leukemia with chemotherapy, and they were also cured of their uh, excellent skid by the, by the gene therapy. Luckily, gene therapists are a very persistent bunch, and they weren't dissuaded by these challenging times. They went back, designed more safe protocols and better vectors, and in the mid to late 2000s, really started to see some clinical efficacy with AAV. For example, AAV2 injected subretinally was used to treat blindness caused by mutation RP65. We also saw clinical efficacy in trials of hemophilia with an AAV encoding factor 9. There's other several examples of efficacy in clinical trials, including hemophilia A, recently. Finally, in the last eight years, there's been three either EU or FDA approvals of different AAV-based gene therapy products. So what is AAV? AAV stands for adeno-associated virus, as it was discovered in the 1960s in a preparation of adenovirus. AAV is a small non-enveloped virus between 20 to 25 nanometers. It's got an icosahedral capsid structure. The genome is single-stranded DNA, and it has a genome of about 4.7 kb. The wild-type virus has so-called rep and cap genes, which stand for replication and capsid genes. The capsid genes encode for three structural proteins, VP1, VP2, and VP3. The actual vectors we work with are completely gutted of the rep and cap genes, which are provided in trans. So all you have of the uh, native virus is the so-called inverted terminal repeats on either end. It's shown here in the schematic of the virus. These ITRs are needed for replication and packaging of uh, your transgene cassette into the capsid. So the gutted sequence is replaced with your actual uh, transgene or your cDNA with a promoter, all your regulatory elements. And the insert capacity is, again, between 4.7 and 5 kb. There's different forms of AAV, a self-complementary AAV, which has a smaller packaging capacity. We're not going to really go into that today. AAV has been shown in several preclinical studies to mediate long-term Episomal transgene expression, in, mainly in differentiated cells such as muscle, neurons, and liver. In rapidly dividing cells, because of the extra chromosomal nature of the AAV genome, uh, it can be diluted out and you can lose uh, expression over time. That said, for certain applications such as genome editing, where you only need a short burst of expression of Cas9 to mediate permanent genome modifications, AV may still be used. AV has been efficacious in many different clinical trials, as, as uh, mentioned earlier, and there's currently three FDA-approved AV-based medicines. So if AV is an FDA-approved medicine, why are we talking today about improving AV for gene therapy and gene delivery? What we're really talking about is that AV has been very useful for certain indications, certain tissues, and certain patient populations. But really, we want to broaden that patient population, treat different tissues for different indications, target certain tissues and organs better than we can with certain, uh, with our current uh, suite of vectors. Some of these limitations are dose-limiting toxicity. This has been reported in non-human primates. It's not entirely clear the mechanism by which this is occurring. It may be immune-mediated against the capsid or perhaps transgene overexpression. There's relatively low efficiency of uh, brain transgene 
delivery and expression after IV delivery of AAV. Many different serotypes do cross a learning barrier. However, relatively high doses are, are required. One of the most challenging obstacles for AAV gene therapy right now are immune obstacles. This can involve both pre-existing immunity or immune memory to the wild type virus, which many of us have, as well as immune responses that are induced after the relatively large dose of AAV. Finally, something we're not going to cover in this talk, but something that is in, um, a limitation is transgene capacity. AAV only, again, carries about 4.7 to 5 kb. So for cDNAs and pr large promoters, um, a larger payload capacity is needed. And there are strategies that are currently addressing this. Some of the strategies I'm going to be talking about later, showing some data from our lab, involve uh, evasion of the immune response. I'm going to cover this limitation of AV in a little more detail on this slide. So basically, there's two forms of immunity to AV. First is immunity to the wild type virus, which many of us are exposed to. That's called pre-existing immunity. And there's also immunity that can come after you're actually injected with a, with an AAV vector for therapy. So you can see exposure to, to wild type AAV early in life can induce both capsid specific T cells. These can be CD4 helper cells and CD8 cytotoxic T lymphocytes. You also induce a B cell response, which results into a, a robust production of anti-AAV antibodies. These tend to decrease over time, so they're not extremely high generally when later in life when you're treated with AAV. However, the titers can vary a lot. So upon vector delivery, the capsid has to first um, is first challenged with those antibodies in the humoral response. If the titer of antibody or the concentration is too high, the vector will be neutralized and it can't deliver its transgene. Finally, a couple, or next, a couple weeks later, after the vector is transduced and there's antigen presentation of the capsid, the cytotoxic T cells can come in and eliminate the capsid in the genome and kill the cell, so you lose expression of your transgene. That happens in some patients been seen in the clinic. There's been strategies using high-dose steroids that have helped to mitigate that response, but it's still a challenge. If you bypass, if you're able to bypass that, you can even have an immune response to your actual transgene product, the protein, if, if it's recognized as non-self. If you bypass all these things, um, you can lead to long-term transgene expression. Another area of improvement for AAV-mediated gene delivery is crossing the blood brain barrier and delivering to the CNS. So historically, and it's still done for some indications, um, AV was used just to bypass the blood-brain barrier. You could directly, stereotactically inject it into the brain. Now, this has some um, obvious benefits. Um, a lot of the systemic immune system is not exposed to the virus, so you have a lower immune response. However, kind of the con to this is that there's lower spread of the virus after direct injection or even into the ventricles. So depending on your your disease uh, in the in the brain, whether you need to hit a larger uh, number of cells, this may not be sufficient. So in the late 2000s, it was discovered that AAV9 could cross a blood-brain barrier. This was a huge advancement for the field. Um, now, the, the the pros are obviously that you can treat a broader number of cells in the brain. However, you expose the rest of the body to the virus, and this could lead to, you know, off-target toxicities, whether that's immune response or the transgene, because it requires pretty high doses, you know, over 10 to the 14 genome copies per kg to get reasonable transduction. So if we can use viruses that are more efficient, they give you um, higher number of percentage of cells that are transduced and at a lower dose, you may be able to avoid some of these systemic toxicities. So now we've covered really why we need to make better AAVs. 
we get to the fun part of the talk where we discuss about strategies to make better vectors. So one of the most popular ways to select for better virus vectors, including AAV, is to use so-called virus libraries. These are made through randomized ligands being cloned into the capsid or making capsid chimeras using DNA shuffling, which we'll talk about later. So use high efficiency cloning techniques to make diverse libraries that can range from 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 10th independent clones of a virus. You then perform in vitro or more commonly in vivo selections, which can result in enrichment of clones, which can complete the entire transduction process. You're really doing survival of the fittest here um, with your selection. Um, and it's really a black box approach. You don't understand the mechanism of transduction, but you can, you're really selecting for a phenotype. This is shown in the schematic here where you in round one, you have a mixture of different capsids uh, represented by different colors and they have different properties. And as you perform subsequent rounds and reproduction of the virus, you can see that the green clone is most efficient at whatever your particular phenotype is. In this case, maybe it would be gene delivery to the brain. Inspired by bacteriophage libraries, folks started using peptide display libraries on AAV for the last couple decades. In this strategy, you basically have a library of random peptide inserts, usually about seven to nine amino acids. And these are cloned into an exposed loop region on the VP3 uh, protein, which is on the capsid surface. You basically clone this in usually between amino acids 588 and 589, depending on the serotype, it might be 587. And this is on an exposed region of the capsid at the threefold axis of symmetry, which you can see on this model are the little three blue dots. So it's exposed in these trimers on the capsid surface. And then there can be as many as 50 copies on VP3 expressed. Another popular strategy to make AAV libraries is through so-called DNA shuffling. Directed molecular evolution using DNA shuffling has been used for decades in other molecular biology fields to improve enzymes and antibodies. And it's been used um, for AAV for the past at least 10 years. So basically, in this, in this concept, you're basically taking the whole capsid gene that's shown on the left of the slide with the different colors uh, from different serotypes or different variants of AAV. You then chop this up with DNAs, and you can reassemble these capsids through PCR. And then you clone that back into your AAV plasmid. And what this does when you produce the virus, you can make these new chimeric capsids, which are built from many different serotypes or variants. And these can have different properties from the parental serotypes. And then you do the same type of selection that we were talking about, different rounds of selection in vitro or in vivo. And this strategy has been successful at identifying vectors with unique properties for in vivo delivery. Based on my, my own experience working with DNA shuffled and peptide display libraries, as well as the rich literature on this with many different pioneers in the field, I'm going to talk about some of the key factors that I think are important to consider when performing AAV library selections. So the first is your actual library complexity. This is kind of how you build the library, how well uh, it's built and how many, um, how diverse the peptides are. Another thing is bias. Is your library actually biased to certain peptides? And we're going to talk about how this can occur. Finally, something that you know a lot of people don't talk about, but you can have wild type virus contamination. Not, I mean, what I mean by wild type is your um, parental serotype that you built the library from that can easily overgrow your library. Finally, there's defective capsids. A lot of these are caused by uh, stop codons that may be in your uh, generation of your library, and there's ways to minimize that. Next, I think the selection approach is really key to getting your desired uh, phenotype. Finally, choosing candidates 
from the data you get out of these rounds of selection is also the most critical thing. Sometimes it's easy to choose from depending on how condensed the library is, but sometimes you have to use strategies to kind of pick out what the most likely candidates to mediate the phenotype of transgene delivery you want. So what do we mean when we talk about library complexity? Well, it's really about the diversity of your different capsids. Do you have a lot of different peptides in all possible combinations? Or is there some bias with just a few different uh, peptides? So I gave an example here of theoretical complexity for a 7 mer amino acid library. As you know, at the nucleotide level, there's 61 codons in seven positions. So that would give you 3 trillion combinations. However, because the code is degenerate and there's only 20 amino acids, you're going to actually have only a billion combinations, which is still a lot. Actual complexity is a whole other thing and depends on several factors. Some of these things have to do with the fact that you're working with a degenerate amino acid code. So there's unequal representation of some amino acids. There's one to four codons, depending on which amino acid it is. Technology that you use to make the library can alter this. Using NNK primers, you can reduce some of those um, codons that are used more than once. And you can also use it to get rid of stop codons. We'll talk about that in a minute. Also, the process which you use to generate the plasmid used for the AAV library prior to production is important. We'll talk about that. Finally, AAV production can also reduce your actual complexity because some of these peptides are not going to work in the context of capsid, so you won't actually make that peptide. So here are some tips for maximizing library diversity and complexity. This has all been learned by experience by a lot of great labs in the field. So if you have an issue such as wild type contamination, if your library is an AV9 library, such as the one I'm going to be talking about later, um, you can have contamination in your library. This reduces the complexity and it can actually completely overgrow your library. So possible solutions to eliminate this contamination are using restriction sites in your library that kill the wild type AV capsid, but not the library fragment. This has been done in the work with the Create Library by Deverman and Gradnaro. I've also found that using dedicated reagents, incubators, and hoods for library production separate from your normal viral vectors is a good way to reduce contamination with um, your parental AAV serotype. However, there is some room for error. Um, we've seen anywhere between 1 and 10 percent of uh, wild type AAV9 contamination in our library by next generation sequencing, and we've still been able to do successful selections. The next is you want to maximize your complexity. How do you do that? First, uh, Deverman and Gradnaro didn't transform the plasmid into bacteria. That's what most people had done previously. They actually directly transfected the library ligation right into your 293 producer cells. And this is was used to reduce another way to um, a loss of, of complexity when you grow up these sequences in bacteria. Another way is to optimize your PCR with randomized NNK primers. These NNK primers eliminate some of the codon-rich amino acids to more normalize the playing field for all the amino acids. You can also use available semiconductor-based oligotechnology from CROs. This gives a more precise control of the amino acid ratios and coverage and also eliminates some of the stop codons. And this plays into how do you minimize defective capsids? Um, this is done by minimized cross packaging by low molecules of plasmid transfected per cell during production. We're going to cover that later. You can minimize stop codons using the NNK primers, which don't eliminate all stop codons, but two out of three or use a newer library technology from one of these CROs that I mentioned above.
another key, if not critical, part of using libraries effectively in Vivo is your selection approach. This is, again, a critical step in the optimal use of directed molecular evolution. The key thing to remember is it's a black box approach. You get what you selected for, even if it wasn't what you wanted. So you really need to consider what the different parameters in your selection are. So selective pressure drives the condensation of the library. So you can have a reasonable number of candidates. So you need to consider what selective pressures you have in your model. So here's some of the tips and possible solutions that we've seen as well as has been reported by different labs. First, you need to think carefully about what pressures are in your model. Do you want to select one strain of mouse or across different mouse strains or across species? Because ultimately you want something to work in humans. This is gene therapy. So do you want to do the selection in monkey? That's what a lot of groups are switching to now. As some of the earlier work has shown that just selecting a mice can give a vector that works really well in that particular strain of mouse, but it doesn't really translate to larger species such as non-human primates and probably won't to human. So you really need to think about that when you're designing your selection. Does your model's physiology in the target tissue represent what your desired phenotype is? For example, should you select, do your selection in a naive mouse brain if your target tissue has inflammation, such as Alzheimer's disease? Or conversely, are you introducing inflammation in your model that normally isn't there? Because that is what you're going to be selecting in the context of. Choosing candidates. So things to consider are both the complexity of the initial library capsids it can produce well, which can lead to overrepresentation in your library, and selective pressure. That factors into how many candidates you may have to choose from when you're done with your selection or when you think you're done with your selection. So typically candidates are now chosen from NGS sequencing data. Historically, this was done with Sanger sequencing clones, uh, bacterial clones, and you know, in some respects, this was easier to choose candidates because um, you could ju you just had a few clones to look at, and often you'd think you had just a couple of clones. But when you look at NGS data, you get an overall picture of the um, of the selection. Typically, we do about uh, low depth NGS, so we're looking at around a hundred thousand reads um, with our selections. So some of the tips to um, choose your candidates are to perform multiple rounds of selection to kind of weed out the less efficient capsids and enrich the most efficient. Another way is to use strong selective pressure, such as transgene expression. That's what I'm going to be talking to you about in a minute, to condense the library in fewer rounds. Finally, it's good to follow the next generation sequencing data over multiple rounds. Look for the most enriched capsid over rounds one to three versus just the most prevalent clone. This has been used by groups such as David Schaefer to kind of pick out the most likely candidates. So what is cross-packaging and mosaic AVs and how does that pertain to library selections? Well, it's basically a loss of genotype, phenotype linkage, and this can really confound your candidate selections. So let's take an example of two capsid genes represented in blue co color or green color and they encode the capsid proteins shown here with blue and green capsids. And when you transfect to generate your library and producer cells, usually 293 cells, um, if you have both plasmids in the same cell, there's a chance that you'll have cross packaging, meaning the green capsid could package the blue capsid genome or vice versa. Now, what will this do? When you do your selection, if the green capsid is efficient at transduction of the brain, say, when you isolate the DNA from the brain, if that green capsid is the most efficient, you would hope that you would see the green DNA. However, because it was cross-packaged, you're going to see the blue cap gene, and you're going to wrongly think that it was the blue capsid mediating the transduction when it wasn't. 
should see the green. So how do you minimize that? Well, there's been some actually nice studies on this in the, in the past couple of years in a recent paper by the Vandenberg Lab where you can basically just transfect a low amount of AAV per AV plasmid per plate or per cell so that you can minimize this cross-packaging. However, if you go too low, you do reduce the titers of your AV library. So these papers have really defined that there's kind of a sweet spot where you can minimize this cross-packaging and still get good titers of AV. So I recommend uh, reading up on these studies. Now I'm going to give you an example of an actual library selection. I'm going to talk about a recent publication our lab put out found a library we called the iTransduce library. The steps to successful vector transduction are many. First is distribution to the target organ after vector injection. Next, you have target cell binding, inter internalization and intracellular trafficking, nuclear import of the capsid, and finally transgene expression. Now, most selection schemes with different libraries don't differentiate between capsids, outside cells, inside cells, or within nuclei. There's an exception to that, and that's the CREATE library created by Deverman and Gradnaru that does select for a vector that can make it to the nucleus. So we thought selecting the most downstream part of transduction would be optimal in terms of condensing a library, having a lot of selective pressure, as well as finding candidates with a good chance of mediating the desired phenotype, which is transgene expression. So this is an overview of the iTransduce platform. First, we have a typical AV9 capsid library with random seven amino acid inserted in between amino acid 588 and 589 of VP1. The unique part of this library is that we had a sensitive Creek cassette, which can be driven by any promoter. For this initial study, we used chicken beta actin CMV hybrid promoter. So the first step in using this library is that you inject it similar to a typical peptide library into the mouse. We used intravenous administration because we wanted to select for vectors that can enter and transduce the brain after IV delivery. We used a flock stop TD tomato mouse. This is a crease sensitive mouse that expresses this cassette in, or contains this cassette in every cell in the body. So if you had a vector that could enter a cell but didn't express Cre, it wouldn't remove these stop sites for transcription and you wouldn't have T tomato expression. However, if the capsid could mediate all steps of transduction, you'd have Cre, it would remove the stop signal and you would get successful T D tomato expression. So next, after a given amount of time, a couple of weeks, a few weeks, you isolate your target organ or target tissue, you homogenize it, and then you can sort your TD tomato cells as well as a marker of interest if it's a particular cell type. Now you're only looking at cells in which the virus can mediate transduction, only capsids that can do this. So now you're doing next generation sequencing of the, only the capsids from the cells that mediate transduction, where they were transduced. So then you're looking at potentially transduction competent vectors. So we did an initial round of selection just as a typical library. We didn't do any TD tomato selection in order to condense the library a bit. We then performed a selection, a round two selection with a library, and we looked at either conventional selection, no sorting of TD tomato positive cells, and then just did NGS, or we did the I transduce selection where we actually dissociated brain and flow sorted out TD tomato positive cells. So on the left, this is uh, round two data. On the left, you can see a flow diagram where we actually sorted out TD tomato positive cells. Out of the whole brain, we sorted 3,810 TD tomato positive cells, which we rescued uh, DNA to amplify the capsid gene. On the right, we also took an animal and did histology to look for TD tomato expression. You can see that the library is very functional. Not surprising in the liver, there's high levels of TD tomato expression, as seen by this DAB staining in the liver on the top. And in the brain, which is much less transduced, not surprisingly, as these capsids have to cross the blood-brain barrier, 
but we did see sparse transduction as shown with this astrocyte here on the bottom, indicated with the red arrow. So we looked at the capsid sequences by low depth NGS, by first in the conventional selection, where we didn't do TD tomato positive selection. And what you can see is there's some very enriched clones seen with the clone FVV GQSY at 22% and the other peptide QPRLTEL with 5%. But then there's a lot of other uh, candidates shown by the various shades of blue and then a lot of other clones seen in the 30% in red. So you had hundreds of candidates to potentially select for. When we looked at the library using TD tomato or I transduce selection for captives that mediated transient expression, we really only had three capsids to look at, three clones. It was what we called the S clone, the F clone at 30%, and then a clone that had a stop codon, which we considered to be cross packaging, so we didn't further consider that. So we went forward with these two clones, the AVS and the AVX. We then took these candidates, AVS and AVS, and we used a conventional reporter, a transgene expression cassette, CBA, driving GFP, to look at whether they mediated good transduction of the brain after IV delivery. We compared them, AVS and AVS, to AV9, the parental capsid used to make the library, and PHPB, the capsid that was derived from the great library by Deverman and Gradnaro and shown to mediate very efficient transduction of the CNS in, in black six mice. We then produced these as conventional capsids and packaged them, purified them with IDX and all gradients. And we looked at production efficiency, genome copies per cell. And all capsids produced quite well, slightly lower than AAV9. We next tested the four vectors for GFP expression in the brain after IV delivery via tail vein injection. Three weeks after injection, we sacrificed the mice and looked at GFP in the brain. As you can see for AV9, you saw some expression with GFP. This is native endogenous GFP expression. With PHPB, you see very robust expression throughout the brain as reported by Deverman and others. AVS seemed similar to AV9, while AVF gave really robust expression across the entire brain. These are higher magnification images across many different brain regions. And as you can see, both with AAV, PHPB, and AVF, we saw broad transduction across all areas of the brain. We also looked at um, which cell types are being transduced with AAV, F, and S. And primarily, it was neurons and astrocytes. Both vectors transduced uh, these two cell types just that AVF was much more efficient than AVS. We quantitated, stereologically quantitated, and counted the percentage of cells that were transduced. AVF had a, a slightly higher uh, tropism to astrocytes than PHPB, and it was a reverse for neurons. PHPB had a slightly higher tropism for neurons than, than AVF. To get a better understanding, on whether AVF had a similar mechanism of transduction to PHPB, we tested transduction after intravenous injection in valve C mice, as PHPB is known uh, not to transduce the strain well. Interestingly, we found that AVF transduced the valve C brain as well as it did the black six brain, indicating the mechanism of transduction between these two capsids is likely different. So to conclude, these results from the iTransduce library, we found that using this uh, transgene-based expression allowed rapid condensation of the library after just two rounds of selection. One out of two of the tested clones mediated the desired phenotype, which was robust and efficient transduction of the CNS after IV delivery. We are currently testing AVF in non-human primates, with the caveat that not all um, Studies in mice can translate into, you know, monkeys or humans, depending on what, you know, receptor was targeted, whether it's conserved between species. So we may need to do direct selections across species, transgenic mice and rats, 
to achieve translation to humans. We're currently looking into this. We're now going to move to a completely different strategy that my lab's worked on for about the last 12 years, the use of extracellular vesicles to enhance gene transfer with AAV vectors. So what are extracellular vesicles? Well, this slide dem shows there's different types of, of extracellular vesicles or EVs. So in the center, you see a cell with the nucleus shown. And you can have different types of EVs. One is called exosomes, which you may have heard of. Those are very rather small vesicles, 30 to 100 nanometers, that result from interluminal budding of multivesicular bodies. Microvesicles tend to be a bit larger, 100 to 1,000 nanometers, and they are usually coming from budding directly off the plasma membrane. Apoptotic bodies are very big, 1 to 5 microns. Um, again, they, they happen during cellular apoptosis. We're mainly going to be focusing on microvesicles and exosomes, although the field is still developing and some of these populations um, overlap in a lot of their features. This slide is meant to demonstrate how extracellular vesicles are natural transporters of proteins and nucleic acid between donor and recipient cells. And in the recipient cell, they can be taken up through multiple mechanisms, such as receptor-mediated endocytosis and macropenocytosis. And many of these mechanisms are also used by viruses. So over the past several years, there's been a broadening literature that's really blurring the distinction between enveloped and non-enveloped virus. Several studies demonstrate viruses use extracellular vesicles to enhance infectivity and immune evasion. This has been shown for viruses such as hepatitis A, as well as rotaviruses and neuroviruses, and even polioviruses. In 2012, we published our finding uh, of the discovery that AV vectors, which is a non-enveloped virus I mentioned earlier, can associate with extracellular vesicles and be found in the media in that, in that state. Um, a lot of the vector still is non-enveloped, but some is in these extracellular vesicles. We initially started our study looking at the larger vesicles, the microvesicles, but we've since looked at um, smaller exosome-like vesicles as well. Shown here is a cryo EM image where you can see the lipid bilayer of the extracellular vesicle as well as several AV capsids inside, at least six or seven capsids can be seen inside the vesicle. So we termed this system ExoAV, exosome associated AV. And over the past eight years, we've published several papers with a lot of great collaborators showing increased in vivo transduction compared to conventional AV. We've shown resistance to neutralizing antibodies. As you remember, this um, is an issue with pre existing antibodies for some patients. We've also shown increased penetration of biological barriers, um, particularly in the uh, retina. Some of these um, papers are shown here, where we showed antibody evasion with XOAV and transduction of the brain, enhanced transduction of the retina after intravitreal injection, and enhanced transduction of the liver and expression of factor IX in a model of hemophilia with XOAV8, and finally, enhanced transduction of the inner ear using exosome-associated AV. In recent years, there's been uh, a few other groups who have been using exosome-associated AV to enhance the properties of AAV. While these results are very exciting and provide a lot of proof of concept, this is exoAV is a complex system, and there are many manufacturing and regulatory hurdles that need to be overcome before it can be used as a medicine. I'm going to end our presentation with a really brief uh, couple slides about repurposing AV capsids for new indications and tissue targets. I'm going to just show you an anecdotal example here. So why would you want to repurpose capsids? 
first it's relatively cheap. There's no vector development involved. All the hard work's been done by somebody else or maybe yourself and you just want to test it in the uh, vector in the context of another tissue. And finally, you might get lucky. It's a trial and error approach. So um, in some cases, we haven't been lucky. And in this example, we did get lucky. In the past several years, gene therapy for hearing loss has really picked up. The major organ responsible for hearing is the cochlea, shown here with this snail-shaped structure and the schematic. And within those, within the cochlea are so-called hair cells, which are responsible for allowing us to hear. Shown here is a higher magnification in a cross-section of the cochlea showing there's two types of hair cells, inner hair cells and outer hair cells. Those have been traditionally hard to deliver transgenes to with viral vectors, including AV. The capsid AV9 PHPV was developed for robust transduction of the CNS after IV delivery. Mainly this transduces neurons and astrocytes. However, we gave it a shot to transduce the hair cells of the inner ear. I'm just going to briefly cover the results of two recent publications where I've used AV9 PHPB to transduce these hair cells in both mice and in non-human primates. Remarkably, after round window membrane injection of AV9 PHPB into both mice and in monkey, we found robust and efficient transduction of both inner and outer hair cells. This was the first demonstration of transduction of hair cells in a non-human primate to our knowledge. So while unexpected, the ability of AV9 PHPB to translate efficient hair cell transduction from mice to non-human primates does show that while unexpected, using repurposed capsids for new indications can pay off. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the great people, scientists, and collaborators I've had the pleasure of working with over the years to accomplish our research goals. I'd also like to thank the NIH for providing uh, funding for the work in the inner ear and with the XOAV platform. I'd also like to thank Genscript for really providing stellar services for a lot of our um, cDNA synthesis for a lot of our AAV plasmids. And finally, um, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention for, uh, during my talk. And I really look forward to having a lively discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Casey, for sharing your exciting research with everyone. My name is Dr. Kimberly Arnold, and I am the product manager for Molecular Biology Services at Genscript. Before we proceed to our Q&A portion, I would like to share some information with you about Genscript. We are a premier contract research organization, and with the goal of making research easy, we strive to remain a reliable research partner for scientists across the globe, with currently over 110,000 customers in over 160 countries. We take pride in being the number one gene synthesis provider in the world. However, we not only make DNA, we also do a whole lot more. We have comprehensive portfolios focused on protein services, antibody production, NGS panels, and peptide services, as well as offering a number of catalog products and services focused on the development of biologics. We also provide solutions to support gene therapy research, including gene synthesis, mutant libraries, and genome editing services. We have over 17 years of experience synthesizing genes and to date have completed over 600,000 gene synthesis projects. We are able to quickly synthesize any gene of any length and clone into the vector you desire. Additionally, we offer a variety of mutant library services and powered by our semiconductor-based DNA synthesis technology, we can precisely construct mutant libraries with superior diversity and complete coverage to optimize your proteins or viral vectors. Finally, we offer comprehensive CRISPR solutions to support gene and cell therapy research including CRISPR guide RNA libraries, our new safe edit single guided RNA, ensuring minimal cytotoxicity and off-target effects for primary cells and stem cells, and high fidelity, high purity DNA templates like long single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA for maximizing CRISPR knock-in efficiency and accuracy. 
For more information, please visit our website at www.genscript.com. Thank you very much, Casey and Kimberly, for your presentations. It is now time for the question and answer session. To ask Casey or Kimberly a question, please type it in where it says type your questions here and then press submit. So, our first question. What is the diversity needed of a captive library to move forward with the selection, Casey? Oh, uh, thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, really, that uh, that depends. Uh, we like to have at least a million variants. Um, you like to have enough diversity in your captive library to actually probe the biology that you need to overcome to mediate trans transduction. Um, typically, folks in the field are are in the in the range of ten to the sixth to ten to the seventh, usually clones for these. Um, these seven more capsid libraries. Thank you very much for that clarification. Our next question. Is the GFP expression in the brain related to the crossing efficiency of the AAV? Yeah, that's, that's, a great, that's a great question because it does depend on a couple, a couple of things. First, whether the virus can cross the virus vector in this case, and also whether it can mediate transduction, which the end result is GFP expression. Um, so generally, with generally yes, it does correlate in terms of if you have a capsid that can cross the blood-brain barrier, it usually mediates higher transgene expression. However, we do a physical measurement as well, which is qPCR of AAB genomes to to actually look at that. Um, and and we did do that for ABF. I didn't have time to show the data, but it is in the in our publication. So, um, but you do have to assess both the physical targeting as well as uh, a transgene expression. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Our next question. Can AAVF type virus transduce other tissues like liver or muscle? That's a great question. Uh, we have looked at that in our in our um, uh, publication and we did find that AAVF transduces liver, muscle, um, some other organs as well. Uh, we haven't gone into detail, but we just we looked during the same study. We we're looking at the brain. Um, that does that does again show that if you didn't want it to transduce the, if you only wanted to transduce the brain um, and not the other organs, you'd have to um, engineer it additionally in other ways. Yeah, right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next question. Can you say more about uh, what the mechanism is of blood-brain crossing? Sure. If that blood is related, blood-brain barrier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if that's related to our actual the capsids that we identified, AVF, um, that's currently unknown. Um, again, it's uh, that would that would take some research to. It'd be interesting to find out, and maybe we will someday. Uh, for example, we still don't know how AV9 crosses the blood-brain barrier. Um, the the really uh, the well-known uh, AV9 variant PHPB, we do know that it uses Li6A to cross the blood-brain barrier in mice. Um, that's a longer story, but uh, for some we do know, but but for the uh, we do, we currently don't know for AVF. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question: Do wild-type AAV or its derivatives transduce lymphoid cells? Um, can AAV be directed to lymph nodes via subcutaneous injection? Yeah, um, that, this is a great uh, <coughs> question, and we've actually begun to explore this. So other groups have actually shown, um, you know, maybe the last 10 years or so, that certain AAV serotypes can transduce thymocytes um, after intrathymic delivery in mice and even in, in non-human primates. So that was really exciting work. Um, we recently published a paper showing that we could also, uh, using AAV8-based vectors, transduce uh, CD8, CD4 T cells as well as B cells after intravenous injection, although really high doses of a self-complementary vector were, were needed. Um, regarding the subcutaneous injections, 
uh, it's definitely feasible. I, I, we haven't tried it. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question. How susceptible are murine models to neutralizing antibodies when using PHPBV vectors across blood-brain barrier in mice that were administered systemically? Sure. I hope I answer this, I um, hope I get their question properly, but if I'm understanding correctly, um, what they're asking is if you inject PHPV in mice, uh, if the mouse is naive, it's never seen this vector, then you know, most most mice don't have a lot of antibodies to AAV vectors, um, then it would transduce the brain just fine. Uh, however, if you uh, pre-treated the mice or uh, with, a, with a vector, such as PHPV, um, it would develop antibodies to that, so you wouldn't be able to then deliver PHPV in the face of those antibodies as it would still be susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. Okay, thank you. Our next question. Can you please explain the difference between virus and DNA shuffled libraries? Yes, I I will try to see if I get this question. I think they're talking about maybe between a, a peptide library and a DNA shuffled library. Uh, if that's the question, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to answer that one, and I, I apologize if that's not your exact question. But really, the the peptide library you insert random small seven mer peptides into an exposed uh, loop VR8 loop usually on the surface of the capsid, whereas the shuffled libraries really just take the whole capsid gene of many different um, many different uh, serotypes and just reassemble them randomly. So they can differ all along the surface of the of the capsid, whereas the peptide library is really just one little peptide in one specific region uh, of the capsid. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question, how good is the correlation between reported gene expression and therapeutic gene expression after an in vivo library selection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, you also, you know, sometimes we rely on a reporter genes too much, I agree. And uh, uh, you do have to be careful with that and, and you, have to, you, have to, you have to study it, but I'd say in general, we've done some preliminary work with that capsid AVF using another transgene, uh, actually therapeutic transgene, and we have seen good correlation with our uh, with our GFP data. But I think, um, depending on the localization of that transgene, whether it can be toxic, um, that that you do need to do those studies and, and take um, you know realize that is a caveat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. How to prevent? How do you prevent the cross packaging during uh, library generation? Yep, that's a great question. Uh, typically, that's done by um, limiting the amount of plasma DNA you put per cell. So if you you basically can only have a small number of AEV library plasmids per 293 cell, there's less chance of having two viruses competing for. Uh, what virus genomes going into which capsid in that cell. So typically diluting down the library is how, how that's done. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, our next question asks whether or not you lose tropism by enveloping in an exome. Yeah, that's a great complex question, something we're still trying to understand. Um, I would say this, um, based on our studies, both with uh, looking at biodistribution of just exosomes, uh, we see they go to many areas of, that AV also goes to, um, and and what we're seeing is uh, it's well known that the first step of uh, of entry, you know, is is cell surface binding, but you know there's many steps of transduction and tropism by AV vectors. Um, a lot of that is post entry, and we believe that. Um, that post-entry, the, the AV capsid is doing the most of the work there. So I think that there will be some tropism that still um, is due to the capsid, but we still have to um, we still have to do those experiments. We're still working on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is where we need to finish for today. Uh, we're aware that there are a number of questions that we didn't manage to get to. 
and we will get back to you offline after this broadcast finishes using the details that you've provided. I'd like to thank Dr. Casey McGuire and Dr. Kimberly Arnold once again for their presentations and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsor, GenScript, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com forward slash webcast. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.